Folks, we are beginning a study of the book of 1 Peter today. Now, it's always important to know who the book's intended for and what was the situation being addressed. You know, we want to know what it means to us, but we can't know that unless we first know what it meant to them. So we can tell who wrote this book and to whom it was written by doing a little bit of Bible detective work right there in the first verse. It says, I, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, am writing. So right off the bat, we know, first, we know Peter wrote 1 Peter. And he says, I am writing to those who reside as strangers, who were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now these were all um, provinces, Roman provinces, in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Now, this is the, the Apostle Peter writing from Rome, it turns out, to mostly Gentile Christians, and he's addressing a problem. He talks about it starting in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and we'll obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in those last times, now in this you greatly rejoice, even though, and here's the problem, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Now, this is kind of a bit of masterful understatement on Peter's part. The, the problem was that they're undergoing persecution. That's the various trials that Peter refers to here. Now, these were Roman provinces under Roman rule, and the Christians had been under growing suspicion of disloyalty to Rome. The Bible commentary says this about the kind of persecution that they were facing. It says, it wasn't mostly violent or criminal persecution in nature, but rather persistent slander, verbal abuse, aimed at demeaning, shaming, and discrediting the Christians in the court of public opinion. That, that sounds familiar. Christians could be ruined through economic oppression, censoring or boycotting of business and trade relationships, the breaking of patron-client relationships, and canceling, that's an interesting word, canceling a person's place of business or withdrawing financial assistance. Now that sounds familiar. And in our time, right now, Christians, or really anybody who doesn't parrot the politically correct uh, line, anybody who isn't publicly woke enough, anybody who doesn't support the proper media-approved candidate, they can find themselves canceled. People who don't applaud the new you know, state religion of wokeness and grievance culture can get themselves fired, their bank's account ca canceled, and their reputations discredited. It's, um, it's tragic, but, but, but today in America, if you got, get caught saying the wrong things, it's going to get you hounded out of polite society. So the, this isn't officially illegal, you know. No, nobody cares if you, don't, if you follow Jesus or not, but you better at least publicly declare your allegiance to our new state religion. And it was just the same with those early Christians here in 1 Peter. The Romans didn't care if you worshipped other gods. There was millions of gods in the, in the Roman you know, Empire. But they really cared if you didn't conform to certain Roman customs. Now, the, one, the main one that got Christians in trouble was that all Roman citizens were expected to demonstrate public submission to Caesar once a year, and they had to do uh, this little ritual. Uh, they, had to, they had to some grains and so forth and say, Caesar is Lord. Now, this was a ritual that all polite, virtuous Romans did. Only deplorables refused. But the Christians, they could not declare that Caesar is Lord because Christ is Lord. They had to stand for the truth and they could not submit to lies. So that's what riled up some of the Roman elites and got the Christians banned or canceled. You know, I'm sure the Christians were just trying to keep their heads down, avoid conflicts, you know, not rile up the natives, but often that did not work out, and the Christians found themselves um, taking a lot of heat because they would not conform to the pagan culture they were living in. So Paul begins um, in this letter by exhorting them to realize that the blessings of salvation that every Christian enjoys right now should give them confidence about something else. He says this, remember, he says, just as you were born again, just as the, as the Holy Spirit of God indwells you, 
you know, you're a new creature, your conscience is sharpened, your behavior has changed, you have new appetites, new motivations, you've awakened out of the sleep of sin, and now you know that God not only exists, but He's your Father and He loves you. These things that you've experienced, he says, are proof that God is with you in this trial, and you can be confident He will fully accomplish His promises. So in verse 3, he says, or remember he says, God's caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now in this you greatly rejoice, even though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed or weighed down by various trials, because the proof of your faith being more precious than gold. Now this is important. It's more precious than gold to God. God takes our loyalty personally and it's precious to Him. So he says, it will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he says to them, he says something to them that he can say to you and me. This is the faith. Though you have not seen Christ, you love Him. And though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him. So you can greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, and you will obtain, as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he says that even though you're distressed right now, even though you're troubled right now, you stay faithful to Jesus because your loyalty is precious to Him, and He will reward. This is your reason to rejoice even in trials. Now listen, they didn't know it at the time, but this persecution was going to ramp up. In a little less than a year, we know, looking back in history, Nero was going to burn down Rome. He was going to blame it on the Christians, and he would begin to instigate a series of persecutions against the Christians in these very provinces. Peter, the very guy writing this letter right now in 63 AD, history tells us that within a year he would be martyred in Rome at Nero's command. Now, you may want to know, how did the churches fare through all this? Did they pass the test? Did they take Peter's advice? Did they remain faithful to Christ? Well, spoiler alert, 40 years later, there was this hostile Roman governor named Pliny. He wrote a letter complaining about the Christians in this area, and this is what he said. He said, the contagion of this superstition is spread, that's Christianity, has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and the farms, and very many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes. They were driving him crazy. They succeeded. The faith multiplied and spread even through persecution. So I think that we're here in our time, we're facing the seeds of a similar situation. So we should pay close attention to Peter's advice in the next chapters. Stay tuned.